Hello and welcome to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Wow, it is crazy to think that we have reached the final episode in the Costa Rica Life, Lava, and Forest series. And just as we started this series with a bang, we're ending it with a huge splash. Today's guest you've heard of but probably didn't know her full story. Remember the viral video from a few years back of a group of researchers pulling a straw out of a sea turtle's nose? Well, the woman behind the camera was Christine Figener, PhD, and for this week's episode, I had the opportunity to sit down with her and explore her work from the past 15 years. Chris is a marine biologist and has spent her career on the beaches of Costa Rica researching and saving leatherback and hawksbill sea turtles. You might be asking yourself, but Brooke, didn't you already have on a sea turtle expert? You are correct, which is why Chris and I talk about a wide range of different topics, including how she left Germany and moved to Costa Rica to be a marine biologist, the fateful day in 2013 in which her close friend was murdered while patrolling a sea turtle beach, and what she decided to do afterwards, how the organization Coasts came to be, how the plastics crisis is affecting our oceans and what we all can do to help, and lastly, battling sexual assault against women in conservation. Yes, we touch on all of these topics and so much more. Chris is an open book and doesn't hold anything back, which I absolutely adore. Because of her openness, we were able to talk about several taboo topics that need to be addressed if things are going to change for the better. If you're enjoying the show and like these travel series, please let me know. You can reach me on Instagram at Rewildology or email me at hello at Rewildology.com. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. All right, everyone, here is my conversation with Christine. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for coming on Rewildology. We're going to have so much fun today. You are an amazing human being, so inspirational, and everyone's going to love you just as much as me. But very soon, well, as we start chatting, everyone's going to hear your super fun accent and wonder where the heck you're from. So let's go back. Where did you grow up and how the heck did you end up in Costa Rica? What do you mean with an accent? <laughs> oh, I love your accent. It's so cool. <laughs> I actually thought about like pulling a really strong German accent while I was defending my PhD, but I didn't. I was too nervous. <laughs> Like stronger than I, I have right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> really so cool. I am from Germany. Originally grew up there and then uh, actually went to university there as well, bachelor, master's. And then during my master's thesis, I first moved to Costa Rica where I lived many years. And then I moved to the States. So at this point, I have a funny accent, German mixed with probably Australian because I work with a lot of Australians. and then. <laughs> Probably some U.S. American at this point as well. So yeah. So I, as as a child, were you did you like find a love for nature, or or where did this start? Where where did all of this begin? Yeah. So I mean, as long as I can remember, I always wanted to be a marine biologist, and I'm pretty sure that it was fostered by my dad. So my dad is a big nature lover and. I mean, even though I grew up in a really tiny coal mining town, super landlocked in Germany, at least I was, you know, privileged enough that my parents did vacations with us and usually at the ocean. So my parents weren't so much of the mountain people. So we were definitely vacationing more close to the ocean. And my dad was also kind of a no bullshit type. He's a German (laughs) engineer. (laughs) And my first ever vacation on the ocean was actually in Greece, uh, Mediterranean Sea. And I remember that I was scared to get into the water because I could see there was like some funny critters swimming underneath the surface. I couldn't really tell what. And I must have thrown a big, pretty big tantrum. So bad, my dad always points out that people from like around were kind of suggesting that he would give me a good spanking. Um, (laughs) so I guess he kind of didn't want to put up with that shit anymore and so he went to like the concession stands up and bought me like a pair of goggles and after that I just remember I was just lying and you know where the waves are breaking it was pretty shallow water 
And I would just kind of lie on my stomach, just like look under the surface and found it so cool and so fascinating, all that stuff that was swimming there. And I'm pretty sure that was probably the moment I fell in love with the ocean. And then my dad, you know, had a lot of books from Jacques Cousteau, you know, the really old ones that were first published and even older than that. There's a kind of an Austrian Jacques Cousteau, his name is Hans Haas. And he had this really pretty wife, Lotte Haas, that was kind of the protagonist actually more than himself on most of his stories and books. And so we had a lot of those books at home. And I remember just kind of, even though when I wasn't able to read at that point, just looking at the photos in those books and just thinking it was so cool. And yeah, and I mean, I mean, I guess I must have told people even in kindergarten already that I would become an ocean explorer. So, and it was always fun because my dad knows a lot of stuff. He's kind of this, you know, person that had a lot of knowledge and has a good way of telling those stories as well. So it wasn't just boring facts, but he would always package that in some cool, interesting thing. And I think that probably sparked my interest for, for nature, for animals to kind of find out more about nature, ask questions about nature, and then eventually become a biologist. Mm. So, okay, so then you're to this point now where it's time to make a decision, what is next? So do you remember what that point was? I mean, you're like, okay, I'm going to pursue specifically being a marine biologist, and I want to go study sea turtles in Costa Rica, or was it more of a journey? And then, and how, how did you get there? Well, it was definitely more of a journey. So, okay. To give you like the, the continuation of that very early story. So I don't know at what point I actually figured out that the career where you can do all those things that I wanted to do is called marine biologist. I really don't remember that, but I do remember that at least when I became a teen, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old, all my friends were in love with the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC were collecting that. And I was actually pretty much raiding the local library for the magazines and books and everything and photocopied the black and white photocopy machine still. <laughs> Every single article that I was able to find on whales and dolphins. So that was my big thing. So I had like massive kind of, you know, binders that just collected those like articles, just like other people collected, you know, articles about, I don't know what their names were, Backstreet Boys people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 90s boy uh, Yeah, so that was kind of how it started. And then we do have to do an internship in seventh grade in Germany where, you know, you go for, I think, three weeks back in the days to like, anywhere that you kind of want to know more about, like a profession that you're interested in. And people would kind of usually go do very boring stuff, <laughs> I thought. And I just for shit and giggles applied to the zoo actually, so that we had a big aquarium back then that still actually had dolphins and, and sea lions. And that was like the closest I could get in my little coal mining town to the big great ocean for my internship. And although they didn't usually accept interns uh, younger than 14. I was 13 at that time. They actually did accept me because I guess I must have come across at least mature enough that I wouldn't, you know, that I would be able to do the work. And I'm pretty sure I stood my, my woman there. I mean, I worked hard uh, because after that, I be, kind of became like um, a staple. So I went back pretty much every single vacation until the day I graduated from high school. Wow. So, and I think the nice thing is, and I mean, I don't really want to start a debate about marine mammals in captivity right now. What I just kind of took away from that experience because it was a very formative experience all those years is we had a lot of students that came from the university, a large university in Germany from the behavioral department that did like their thesis and dissertations there. And so I was exposed to all the scientific working and, you know, also I, I mean, the people were available to just ask questions, right? Like, how, what do you do? How did you get where you are? What do you need to study? What sub subjects do I need to take in high school? What else can I do? And so that was absolutely, that was super helpful because there, I, for example, I was told, okay, you know, you kind of need to learn Latin. That sucked. So I, I chose <laughs> Latin, even though that was the funny part. By the time I graduated, that rule didn't even exist anymore that you needed Latin to study a science in Germany. But back in the days, it still was when I had to choose in seventh grade. 
So I choose Latin. And then the other thing was that they said, well, you know, you should really see that your English is at a good level because every literature in biology is English. And so that was another pretty much big decision because I decided to go to the US for one year when I was in 11th grade to just improve my English, right? So I kind of worked little by little already <laughs> towards a career as a marine biologist, right? And still already did those practicals. I was also um, exposed to some in situ conservation because the, the aquarium itself had an organization that works in South America on aquatic mammals. And so, you know, you I immediately got this conservation component as well and the conservation breeding programs. And so it was a very, I found it was actually a very holistic experience, you know, with so many different aspects of conservation and science and people working in it. And I would say that was probably the most formative thing. But at that point, I still wanted to do uh, actually humpback whales. So that was my big thing. So my family is really big into music. Actually, my middle sister, she did study music. She was the only one that had the balls to do it. <laughs> um, yeah. But music was always a big part of growing up. So most of us play an instrument. We do what a lot of play? music together. And so I was super what, into what, the What instruments did you songs. play? I play guitar. Oh, nice. Nice. I'm a drummer. Yeah. So I had to ask. I was like, what did you oh, play? We can make a little bed now. Woo -woo. Yes, I can. <laughs> you, hopefully you sing because I can't sing. So <laughs> I can, yes. Well, I don't know if I can. I haven't really in a long time. But yeah, no, I used to. We were like the... Um, wedding birthday whatever kind of gig for all the for all the <laughs> family uh, gatherings and stuff. yeah yeah, yeah. Awesome. It was like my sister and i and my dad that was kind of a staple as well Ooh. yeah <laughs> long time ago Just took um, on memory lane <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that was the reason i was really into humping whale songs so i really wanted to study humping whale songs right so there was I always also, I think one of the reasons I really wanted to study biology was there were so many things I felt I could, so many of my interests I could kind of merge, right? I wanted to travel. I mean, that was another thing. I always knew I did not want to live in Germany. So, you know, I always said, I'm going to move out. I'm moving away somewhere into the world. And so, you know, traveling, working with animals, doing something related to music, which did not really work out in the end, but, you know, speaking different languages, all of that was kind of the big, big, big picture. And yeah, and so I think at that point, okay, I, I knew I wanted to study biology because that was in Germany, you don't have a, or you didn't used to at least have a specialized bachelor's for biology up until you get into your master's. So everybody, no matter if you become a geneticist or a botanist or a whatever, you all have to go through the exact same basic studies of biology. Yeah, and so I did it and I freaking hated my guts. <laughs> I hated my bachelor's. Oh my God, I <laughs> was so disillusioned. I really sucked as well because I never, so I was never a bad student. I really wasn't. I was, a, I was actually an A, B student, but without any much effort. So I never learned how to study ever. So I remember my very first exam at university was zoology, right? So all the different anatomical structures of different worms and one cell eukaryotes and all of that. And I thought I hadn't done anything. I haven't, hadn't even paid much attention through lectures. If I sit down the night before the exam, that should be more than enough. That's more than I've ever studied in my life. Well, guess what? I failed, right? I flunked that test like big freaking time. And I really had to learn how to study during my undergrad. And you can see how my grades also got like, you know, gradually better. But I did so much chemistry and so much physics, so much math and so little biology or of the biology kind that I really liked that I, at the end, I was really going to drop out. I mean, I was just going to finish that and say, you know what, this is it. Luckily... I got the chance to go to Egypt on a trip with a new professor that arrived at the university. It was actually a graduate course, but since he was so new and it was, you know, very little time to kind of advertise for it, he opened it up to undergrads. And so I think it was like about a few, like a handful of students of undergrads that were allowed to go, including me. 
And that changed everything because that course took place in Egypt. And it was everything I ever imagined marine biology to be. We had our own projects. We literally spent most of our time in the water collecting data for our projects. And it was just magical. And that professor was also so inspiring. He was not German. So he also had a little bit of a different mindset than a lot of, I guess, German academics. And so, yeah, I mean, he really kind of reminded me or showed me that all the things I envisioned marine biology could be, that it really can be like that. And so I was really happy and kind of, you know, find my, find my enthusiasm again for the whole thing. But I mean, I always wanted to go to, for like my master's to Hamburg because they had like the, at this point or at that time, one of the only working groups that was like specialized in marine mammals. And I studied at a time where Germany just switched over from like an old degree system under which I was, or I, under which I started to bachelor's masters and Hamburg did not want to have the old kind anymore. So they just blank, blank refused to take me. Oh. And uh, yeah, that was kind of a big setback and I had to adjust and think what else can I do and luckily I had all those friends from my time in the you know from my time in the aquarium and I was consulting with them and they said you know what Chris in the end you learn the basics of biology it's kind of the same thing no matter if it's marine biology or whatever ecology it's kind of the same concepts and it's really up to you what or where you will apply it in the end right and so with that mindset I then chose a university that first of all had a behavioral component and an ecology component. And I ended up in Würzburg and that was kind of where the sea turtle magic happened because it was literally the very first day that I stepped foot or set foot into that university. And I was standing in front of a professor's office waiting for him to kind of probably answer some questions, but somebody else was in the office. So I was just, hanging out in front, kind of looking at the walls and you know how people put up announcements on like blackboards and whatever. So I saw this announcement that advertised a research assistant position in Costa Rica for a leatherback project. It was April at that point and that announcement was old. It was like from November the last year and the position would have been for February, but I noted down what organization it was and asked them, I was like, hey, is that something that happens every year or is it, was it just like a once in a lifetime thing? And they were like, no, no, that's every year. So I applied for the next season and got accepted and um, yeah, and went to Costa Rica. I mean, it wasn't so straightforward because I was very worried what my parents would say because I would have had to take like a semester off Mm. And I <laughs> mentally prepared already. I remember I called up my dad and was like, you know, having all the ammunition to convince him that this was a good thing, you know, <laughs> super purposeful. And the only thing he said was like, yeah, do it. God damn it. Nobody cares. Like when you're going to finish your studies in like half a year earlier, half a year later. <laughs> He's like, if I would be your age, I would do it immediately. That was all he said. So that was Woo! simple. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that is how I ended up in Costa Rica. And I guess the rest is history. And I fell in love with sea turtles. I mean, that is just, yeah. <laughs> so so, so let, let's put a time scale on this or a timeline now. So now we, you are in your master's. You're doing this research position in Costa Rica for a semester during your master's. So around what time was this? Yeah. And everybody's going to calculate back how old I am. I'm just kidding. Uh, 2007. So okay. I had been in Costa Rica for a while. Yeah. 2007. And then while I was there, actually one of my, like the, yeah, the, the director of the project was kind of jokingly saying, Hey, why don't you want to stay and work as a biologist? And I was like, Hey dude, I still need to finish my master's. Right. He's like, well, you can do your thesis here. Right. And so that was kind of planting a seed oh. once again. So I went back to Germany and I still had to do kind of a practical and I ended up in, in a genetics lab with a professor and I told her about that and she's like, well, she said, I mean, if you come up with your own funding and if you kind of come up with an idea, I'm happy to like sign off on it. That's not a problem. 
So yeah, that was all I needed. So I found the funding. I found a good topic. So I did actually a paternity study on leatherbacks in Costa Rica. And then I went back again <laughs> to Costa Rica for, for eight months that time for the entire season and collected my data. Yeah. And at that point I knew already, okay, I, I could have a job if I wanted to. And so I literally only went back to analyze the, the samples in the lab to do my final exams. And I didn't even analyze the raw data. I just kind of packed everything up, sold everything, gave everything away, packed my raw data and moved to Costa Rica for good, 2009. That was like the, five, the first year that I was just, I, I said goodbye for good in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. And so it's very You're like, no, this is my home. I'm going back. So were you partnered with a conservation organization or you had your own funding or how, what was the work that you ended up doing with these? Oh, you said loggerheads, right? No, leatherbacks. Leatherback. Leatherback turtles. I'd be bigger. Yeah. The, <laughs> the freaking behemoth turtles. Those ones. Right. So, okay. So now you're back, you're working full time. This is like this, this is my career. This is my life. So how right. did you get back and how did you end up staying? And then what, what progressed from there? Yeah. So I pretty much started working for the organization that I had already been working with the past two years. Right. So I started, um, I mean, the organization slightly changed because they had like a restructuring with like internally, but it was the same project. Actually, the very same one that I now have revived two years ago, which is kind of funny. So the circle is closing like people circle. Yeah, in the Southern Caribbean. And yeah, so they hired me as a biologist. And so I started working with them first. And the, the cool thing is, at least in my opinion, is once you get a reputation, People kind of, I mean, I honestly, I never even had to write a application for anything after that because I was recommended when people, because of course, I mean, within our circle of situated people, people would come up even now to me and say, Hey, Chris, I need like a research assistant or a biologist with like this kind of experience. Do you know anybody that is in the country or, you know, would come to Costa Rica? And so this is how it works. And I guess back in the days, it wasn't very different. And so I got pretty much recommended to another project in Playa Grande, where I worked as a biologist for one season. Then I went back one more season to the project in Gandoka, but that was actually the last season that that project really existed after that um, project shut down. Um, but at that point, I had already another organization on the Pacific again. So I was pretty much just kind of going between Caribbean and Pacific because Leatherbacks nest on both sides and asynchronically. So I always had a job with maybe like a month off per year between nesting seasons. And so I work in Austria now. That was another, another beach from, for several years. And then in the, in the Caribbean season, since we don't, didn't have that one project, I actually worked for a organization that took student volunteers for like kind of two, two week trips into different conservation projects. So I visited or like worked in different projects up to Panama, uh, Pacuare, and also whale and dolphin project, actually. Oh, good. Yeah. So I, I ended up working with humpback whales for several years as well in like the off or like the off season and from the Pacific. But I have to tell you, it did not convert me back to humpback whales because sea turtle work is so much more fun than whale work. Now everybody's going to hate on me, but it's not that I don't like humpback whales. I still love humpback whales, but sea turtle work is super hands-on. You know, I mean, you are first, I mean, it's not like you're restraining the animals all the time, at least unless you do in-water work, but it's just that you're so close and so close proximity. You can take the data on the animal and with whales and dolphins, a lot of the stuff, you kind of just hang out on a boat for hours, watching them in the distance, do their thing, but also just on the surface. So 60, 70% of what happens, you don't even see because it's below water, you know? So yeah, and I'm very, I don't know. I like the physicality of also walking the beach and, you know, digging nests and it just makes you feel good. I don't know. <laughs> They're just sitting on your ass on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> at least you had confirmation where like, yes. because at the time, I mean, I'm sure when you were a young girl wanting to study humpback whales and that didn't come to fruition, sometimes you, you think, what if like, yeah, I love my life now, but what if I was really dead set on this one path because of my 
family's love of music and all this stuff, but that didn't work out. So at least you had that moment of like, yeah, my life definitely went the, the way it should have. Right. Yeah, totally. No, it was, it was, it's always good to have a back confirmation. I even, I even went back to Germany for a few months. Like there was some stuff that happened where I just kind of needed to step away from Costa Rica for a bit. But even then I withered away like a flower in Germany and I was like, <laughs> okay, this is also, yeah, no, there's a reason that I left Germany <laughs> and I cannot <laughs> go back to Germany for longer. <laughs> That's awesome. I feel that way almost every time I go to Ohio. <laughs> exact same way, like where I'm from, from very rural Southern Ohio. And sometimes I'm very grateful for where I grew up, but sometimes I'm just like, yeah, I'm never moving back here. <laughs> just, mm -mm. Yeah. it's just, it's just certain things are nice to visit, but it's not good to really you because you, I mean, you can't stuff yourself back into a tiny little box anymore, right? Yeah. I mean, you're exposed, and it's really, it feels like a thousand steps backwards. And I'm not even judging people that stay at home because sometimes we get really offended. I just say, for me that wouldn't work, right? And I think everybody needs to decide for themselves what type of life they choose because I'm also sure a lot of people would not be happy with my life. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I feel the same way. Like once you've been, your eyes have been open to different experiences and that fits your personality, then all bets are off. Right. <laughs> That's yeah, definitely no. me. I'm going to be freaking miserable. Just, just right. for the exact same reason. Just, I would... I know I would, I, I would feel very stuck and it sounds like that would probably be a similar feeling to what you had too. Yeah. So let's go to 2013 and something pretty major happened that I feel was a big catalyst for a lot of the decisions that happened afterwards. So, and I know this is not a fun topic. So what's the big thing that happened and how do you take it and what did you do afterwards and, and move on from it? Yeah, so in 2013, a really good friend and colleague of mine was actually killed on a nesting beach in Costa Rica. And I don't know if people can envision that, but we live and work with our people, right? With our team. So it's not like you have this job from Monday to Friday, nine to five, but for those five months out of the year, you literally spend 24 seven with the same people. And a lot of times over the years, since the people that are permanent in Costa Rica, it's kind of the same people, right? So our, my, our friend, my friend Heido, he's actually from the village that I, I live in as well here in the Caribbean. So he has been part of my turtle family, had been part of my turtle family for many years. And I was actually the one that took him over to the Pacific side to work with us there as well in the project. And then when the project here in the Caribbean closed down in 2010, and we all kind of scrambled to look for something else to do in the Caribbean season. So when I, for example, went and worked for this volunteer organization, so he ended up working on a beach farther up in the north, close to a really big port in Limon, or the really big port in Limon. And it's a very different, it's a very different situation there. So we have issues on every single nesting beach here with poaching so people stealing eggs people stealing or like slaughtering turtles um, for different reasons usually it's you know sustenance people eat them themselves of course people are poor and they need to sell it but there's also this angle of organized crime around it so unfortunately we also have a big problem with, with drug smuggling narco traffic it comes from colombia and uses actually both coastlines to, you know, transport their drugs. They don't really transport it to Costa Rica, but they, for example, hide gasoline or other things on the way, engine parts, so they can kind of stop over if they need something. I'm sure there's also a certain amount of drugs that stays in the country, but it's these routes. And so these same organizations that organize the smuggle and other horrible stuff, they also have a pretty complex network of how they sell turtle eggs, how they sell turtle meat in the Caribbean. And I mean, we're not entirely sure, of course, how all of that 
fit together, but the beach that he worked on is not or was not or still isn't a protected area. So the beach that I work in, for example, is a protected area, right? So there is park rangers and there is laws and there's a certain certain level of protection, but the beach that he worked on was pretty much just a no man's land. And um, there's a lot of issues with drug users actually going onto the beach and exchanging turtle eggs for, for drugs. There's also the, you know, the people that are patrolling the beach for other reasons because there's certain loads that are coming in or somebody was chased by the coast guards and had to like throw packages overboard. And those people are also seen on the beach patrolling, looking for it. And so they weren't happy that this new turtle project on that particular beach started. And so there were threats pretty much starting from day one. And it was a pretty hot and very uncomfortable beach to work on. I, I was just helping the owner at the very beginning and she kind of joined our workshops so she could set up the project, but Heide was the one that started to work there. And the year before he died, the hatchery got raided, people were threatened, and so they left. And that particular year, yeah, he, um, he got killed. He was dragged behind a car and then died. And for me, for all of us probably that worked in sea turtles, it was just kind of this moment where... Um, but we all had to pause and just think about what we're actually doing and also to contemplate our own our own mortality, probably. I mean, we're young, right? We're in our early 20s. We're thinking we're invisible, uh, indivisible. We think nothing can happen to us, even though we walk these super deserted beaches somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And... I don't think we ever really considered that something serious could happen to any of us. And that was just something really traumatic. And it was the first time really that I didn't just kind of continue to go with the flow, right? Because I was never really stopping and thinking of where I'm actually heading in life, right? I kind of had reached the point where I always wanted to be. I lived away from Germany. I worked as a marine biologist. I had a job I loved. I pretty much got contracts offered, you know, even though it was six month contracts, I always knew already for, you know, where I'm heading next, but it was always this kind of, yeah, where I'm heading next. I don't know, wherever the current is going to bring me. And then the other thing that became, I think during that time, very, very important to me was that I felt this absolute crazy claustrophobic feeling of being so stuck in these very isolated places in Costa Rica, tucked away in the jungle, no cell phone reception, no internet, facing these incredible threats to sea turtles sometimes, in this case of Haido, even human life, and threats that are so beyond our power and our control, right? Because narco traffic is not something that I can fix as an individual. And of course, so many other things, so many systemic issues with how poaching is happening, what happens to sea turtles in the ocean because of plastic pollution, because of fishing that goes beyond our nesting beach where we are working, right? So, so local. And so I felt that, I mean, because I felt so powerless in that situation and so shocked I think because the, that was the moment where the urge grow, grow, grew that I want to have more impact. I need to have more impact. Like I need to see how I can approach this whole conservation thing differently. Where can I set, set the leverage in a way that gives me kind of the most bang for my buck, right? I mean, I only have an in, like a fin finite amount of energy of a lifetime as well. And do I really invest in the most effective, right? Is it really like, am I spending my energies at the right place? And so I went back to Germany. That was actually the moment where I went back to Germany and I said, okay, I need to really, I need to step back. Like I can't deal with all of that right now. I did not last very long. I think I lasted maybe like four months. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I need to get back. But at that point, at least, I had enough time to kind of think about next steps. And honestly, it wasn't very creative. The only thing I could think of was that, okay, 
I'm not happy of being an employee anymore. I really want to be in charge. I think I have enough experience at this point that I can make my own decisions. I also felt as a woman in science that I'm consistently touching glass ceilings, working in a country that has also very conservative, conservative ideas of you know gender roles. And so the only thing I could come up with was like, okay, I need to get back to school and get a PhD so I can be my own boss. I can be an autonomous scientist. I can be taken serious because I have a freaking doctor in front of my name. I mean, there were so many, you know, reasons why that felt right, because I also started a conservation course for uh, students, for German speaking students in Costa Rica. And I mean, I had amazing professors in Germany that's in Austria and Switzerland that all signed off and gave credits for that course. But the reason that I needed those professors was because I didn't have my PhD. I didn't have an official permission to teach, right? I only had a master's. And so all of that, I felt like I don't want to have to depend on other people anymore. I know what I know. So I just need to get the freaking degree that testifies it on paper that yes, Christine has all that knowledge here, bam. <laughs> And that was the moment where I uh, decided that I would go for my PhD and started looking for professors that um, kind of worked in sea turtles. Of course, I wanted to stay in sea turtles and that, yeah, that also had some connection to Costa Rica. And that is how I ended up at Texas A&M, of all places. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very specific subset of categories that you needed to fulfill. <laughs> Right. I mean, it was really all about the professor. Right, and I had right, no right. idea what the university was like, even though the head of program in my recruitment talk actually warned me. So <laughs> <laughs> but I still had no idea what I would get myself into. So, yeah. So how did you like, so thank you so much for taking us through that and how you had this life realization. It's like, okay, what is going to catapult me essentially to the next level. Like I've done this, I've, I've been here, now I need to get here. I need to go to the next level. And like, okay, my answer is a PhD. Great. So how in the world did you find your professor? And then what did you end up studying to fulfill that? Right, yeah, so my professor, I mean, at this point I already was connected to the sea turtle world. And I actually asked some of my mentors uh, that I had met along the way of, who do they suggest? Like who, like I, I told them, okay, I want to study this and this and this. What would be, you know, somebody that would be a good fit and actually two recommended the exact same person. Oh, that's um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I didn't apply only to her. I actually applied to two people. They both accepted me. But at that point, I just felt that, that my professor, Dr. I can say, Dr. Pamela Plotkin was actually kind of the better or the best fit for me at that point. And that's the reason I decided to go with her because she had worked extensively in Costa Rica in her own time as a PhD student and after that as a postdoc. And so I felt that she would probably understand, you know, a little bit more of the culture as well behind it. Yeah. And then what I, okay, that's kind of the secret tip, I guess, but now it doesn't really matter to me. So what I didn't do, I, I did not write an email. So I actually assembled a package. Um, so in Germany, I don't know if you do that in the U.S. or used to do that in the U.S., but when you apply it, you have these like kind of nice, I don't know what you would call them. Folders. Like a folder? Yeah, but they're very specific for applications. So there's like a space for your letter of con, like your, you know, introduction letter for your CV and anything else like, you know, that you might certifications or whatever you had hand in. So I kind of had all of that prepared. I gave of um, a writing sample actually of, of my master thesis and just so that they have an idea as well, my GRE scores and all of that jazz. Did I even give my GRE? Yeah, I did the GRE already. Oh God, I hated that so much. Oh my God, me too. Yeah, it was the worst. Like, <laughs> such a stupid test. <laughs> Anyways, that's I a different story though. <laughs> <laughs> and then I drew like a turtle on it. I'm not very artsy, but I did that. And then I turned it off. I sent it off and um, yeah, I guess that got me through because I know that professors get a lot of emails from students asking for funding and whatever. And yeah, I mean, I guess they couldn't ignore this letter. It wasn't <laughs> just like an email they could click away. Yeah, so I got accepted, which was great. 
into both programs and then I decided to go to Texas A&M and I mean for me the PhD topic wasn't so important I felt I mean for me it was more important that I was able to learn certain techniques that I was really interested in so one of them being satellite tracking and the other one being stable isotopes and there was actually one I really wanted to do but didn't end up actually being able to. And that is like a no, new form of genetic sequencing. But yeah, so I was like, I, I think I had very specific ideas of, okay, what I was interested in learning. Or for example, I mean, there was also the requirements for me to do statistics again. And I was kind of like, okay, I did stats <laughs> in my bachelor's requirement for Germany. I had to do my stats in my master's, which was also a requirement. And now I have to do basic stats again for my PhD. I was like, oh, I mean, I know how to do a T-test. I know how to do a regression. I know how to do an ANOVA. <laughs> Luckily, though, there was a professor that offered all of that R-based, you know, this kind of nifty program. Mm -hmm. And that kind of sold me. I wasn't really like, I knew how to do stats, but I was really interested of kind of, you know, getting to know how to use R. And that was really helpful. And that was also a great course. So I was able to check all those boxes and of course, and I think one of the biggest things that I learned as well, I think my writing skills definitely improved also mm. being, you know, a PhD student, because I mean, I'm sure you don't have that issue maybe as a native speaker, but I felt very inferior my entire time, you know, being at that level and being a non-native and you always feel like you're slightly handicapped, like you only have one leg and one arm and you're a little bit you know, a little bit yeah. behind. Mm -hmm. It's just like you don't have the vocabulary. You don't have, you don't always say, you know, everything grammatically correctly. Maybe you will mispronounce things because you've never ever heard it spoken out loud because you have only read it. I mean, you know what it means, but then you're surprised. You're like, oh, this is how you pronounce it. Okay. <laughs> I still do all of that. So don't feel bad. <laughs> well, but the thing is though, I don't live in your head, right? I'm always living in my head and I felt very self-conscious about it. And I think it helped me a lot. My um, So my co-chair, he's an amazing writer. And uh, so writing with him was very, very helpful. And actually, I mean, he managed to live in my head now. So when I'm writing in English now, like he is this consistent voice that just repeats the same things over and over, like certain things that you just say, you know, Likes done in a certain way, I cannot get out of my head anymore. <laughs> but yeah, that's for awesome. the worst, I think. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So finally, well, how long did it take you to get through your PhD? Because I know they're, everyone's length is different and sometimes they're hella long. So how long did it take you? Yeah. So the plan was, so my plan was I would be in and out in four years. Well, I not said, everyone says that. Not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I had my master's already, right? So I mm -hmm. thought, okay, I mean, I shouldn't need to. I, I mean, I had to take like one year, one year less of classes. And so I thought, okay, I should be able to get that done in four years. Well, first of all, I needed to change my topic after the first year because, yeah, out of reason. So I had to change my topic after I pretty much did a whole year and a field season already and had to kind of start from scratch again. And then after year three, where most of my field work was wrapped up, all of my samples got stuck in the US customs. No. Yes, yes, because CITES fucked up our renewal of our permit. And so what I had was I had a certain amount of specimen that I had collected, but since I had collected for stable isotopes and for a genetic project, they were allocated, right? So, I mean, I used, used to cut them up. Some of them were stored in 70% ethanol. The other part was stored in 90% ethanol. And so I had definitely more vials than I had specimen collected. And the lady in the customs got hung up about that and yeah, confiscated my samples. And it was, to say the least, it was a shit show to get them out. Uh, actually, we thought we were not able to get them out of customs because they didn't respond. Then it went up like a higher level. Um, then we had to, I don't even know what, what it was called, not a claim, but we had to petition them out. Our luck was that the person that kind of 
because they kind of pass it on at a certain point, like a third party lawyer, law person. And that person had just come back from Costa Rica surfing and from the very same beach that I collected samples from. And so he was curious and called up my professor to know, okay, what is the deal with those samples? And so we actually had a chance to explain ourselves. And he was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's not a problem. So here are your samples <laughs> back. I mean, it only took about eight months, right? So that eight was like- Eight months? Oh, yeah. And at oh that point, gosh. I was already ready to go into my next field season, right? So I didn't even have, for into my last field season, I didn't even have time to, to analyze them. So that pretty much set me back another year. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, yeah. all of that taken together. So it took me in, in total five and a half years then. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So then my, I think the next natural question then for anybody who knows somebody who's a PhD student or has gotten their PhD, it is very common for people to stay in academia you know, you have the degree, you have all these things, you have the connections, you could just go be a professor and do what your mentor did, essentially. Why did you not do that? Well, I mean, first of all, I never entered the PhD to become a professor, right? I mean, I think that's the natural order of things. And I think there's also, I honestly don't think there's that much more other than going, if you're, if you're a geneticist or microbiologist, at least, you could go into, of course, the, you know, into the industry and do something there. But I think sometimes with the type of degree that I have, you can go maybe to the government, but I'm not a U.S. citizen. So that means that is not an option either. Um, so there's not that many options, I feel, sometimes other than academia for a foreigner to really do with a Ph.D., but that was never my intention, even though I did get brainwashed because Every person in academia only knows academia, right? So that means that is all you usually kind of get pushed towards. And people try to tell you that's the only way of how you can be happy. Luckily, my female professor also had a different type of, you know, at least insight. So she, she is the uh, director of Texas Sea Grant, um, which is connected to the university, but it's not a purely academic role. And she's also exposed to a lot more beyond academia that way. And so she always was very supportive of me kind of, you know, trying to find my own way. Not so much every committee member. I mean, I love my committee, but I remember after I defended, they were really trying to, you know, hey, so what are you up to? What do you want to do? And I told them, well, I don't know what I want to do, even though I did maybe, but I kind of <laughs> debated with them. And they're like, oh, you should become a professor. You would be great at it. And I had a really interesting conversation with a really good friend of mine who is a professor about being good at something, right? And I mean, yeah, I don't even doubt that I would have been good at being a professor or that I would be good in academia, but would I enjoy it? That is the question, right? So I don't think I would enjoy it because I didn't even enjoy my PhD very much. I felt very enclosed. I felt very restricted. I wasn't used to that anymore. I mean, I was my, you know, pretty much leading projects for eight years prior to my, to my PhD. And then all of a sudden I was like pressed into the student role again with all the responsibilities and you can't just like go off when you want to, because you have to teach, you have classes, you have this, you have that. And I was very unhappy. I mean, I was not, I was not happy and I just stayed because I knew why I came in the first place. I wanted to get this stupid degree. And so that is what I did and that's why I stayed. And then when I even had a postdoc lined up right after, and I even started working already kind of half time while I was writing for my PhD, I started collecting data already for my postdoc and it was just not, it just, yeah, it just didn't fit anymore. And then I got pretty much from three different sides the offer for funding for my own projects in Costa Rica, um, independently from each other. Wow. And one of these people, because I talked that over with her and I said, like, well, I have this postdoc and I mean, I feel very, because after a while you also become, even though you might not be happy, you become very comfortable, right? You become comfortable. This is what you know. This is what you're used to. Do you really want to take the leap of faith? Also, people scare you into, oh my God, 
if the door to academia closes, that is forever. You will never be able to come back and you're going to be so unhappy. And, and I just told myself, you know, I don't believe that first of all. And then actually that lady that offered me funding there said something really important because she said, you know, Chris, do you think you're really going to change the world in a postdoc? And that gave me a moment to pause and also kind of made me rewind and think of why did I start this whole thing in the first place, right? I mean, I came here because I wanted more impact. I wanted to make a difference, not because I wanted to become a professor. And that was really the moment I said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take the leap of faith. I, I mean, the nice thing is over the years, I've really built the trust in my own abilities. And I know I will survive. I know that it might not always be easy. I'm a hard worker. I, you know, I can take care of myself and I will manage, you know, I'm not going to die just because I'm not in academia. <laughs> and it was literally the best decision I've made. I am so glad I didn't shake it out. I'm so glad. Hell yeah. Because look at the impact and we're, and one thing I, one thing I absolutely love about meeting just amazing people like you. Now we're going to get to the impact that you've had. Like you've had this amazing journey about all of these things you've been through. And like, I finally got my PhD and then shit gets real. Like <laughs> this is so fun. Oh my God. Okay. 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 So you have your PhD. You are now Dr. Christine and you have funding. So is this when you launched your nonprofit or did that come later or what, what now happens? Well, it actually happened earlier than, <laughs> than that. <laughs> it was, you know, okay. So the same year that I started my PhD, I actually founded my nonprofit, which was not a great idea. It was a little, <laughs> it was a little bit of, yeah, overestimating my time and capacities while I'm a PhD <laughs> student. I mean, that was yeah. literally before I knew how it would be. So, I mean, I still use the and nonprofit pretty much to work on some research because I'm not the only one, of course, that's part of the nonprofit. So I founded this nonprofit more than anything with a friend of mine and a mentee of mine, which I'm really, really proud of. So she is the first, and I think the only graduated biologist from this tiny village of Gandoka, where I started as a biologist. So I met her when she was like 14 or 15 years old, and I've, you know, been part of her journey um, ever since. And now she is this incredible young professional woman with a degree in biology, of course. And the idea was that over the years, you know, when I also thought about impact and when I was touching glass ceilings, I was so fed up with foreign organizations or city people defining and staring the destination of the work on the ground, right? I mean, I work there as a foreigner, but I work within the communities. I was there 24 seven and the guys that I work with, they were either from the community or a similar rural community. So much knowledge, so many years of experience and still, when there were really important decisions to be made, nobody consulted with us, right? It was always kind of top down and we were not important enough. And I got really, it really upset me. I mean, I honestly, I didn't even get added to like publications that came out of those projects, even though we were the ones that were collecting the data, right? <sighs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I can like, honestly, this is one thing that still pisses me off out of the, like, I would say like six years at the very least of of working for different projects, I have literally nothing scientifically to show. I mean, in the current scene, science is publications. Right. And I ever worked scientifically, right? I wrote all the reports. I did all the analyses of the data, but the publications came out without my name, without anybody's name from the actual, you know, the data collectors. So I was kind of done with that. You know, that was another reason. So we founded the nonprofit. We couldn't really make it work. There was also some other issues about where we, because the Gandoka village is not the easiest one and we really wanted the support of the village and they were kind of dragging their feet and I didn't have the time to be on their ass because I was in the US, you know, trying to get a PhD part-time at least in the US. And so, yeah, it was kind of dormant or like was used for certain things, but not really 
you know, put to work in the extent that we envisioned it until I finished my PhD. And that was then, you know, pretty much we started full time to 2020. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to get back there. So pause. Cliff note. Okay. We're going to get back to 2020 where we really launched. I know that that's your next big project that happens. Happens to coincide with the pandemic. I'm sure that's a whole different story. But let, let's let's steer back because I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about your viral video and <laughs> what happens, just what happened. So I know um, I would say 95% of people listening to this has 100% seen this video. 95%, 100%. Sorry, that did not make any sense. <laughs> But most people listening to this has seen your viral straw video in the sea turtle. So I would love, take us through that experience. And then what happened from there? How did it influence you? Or what was that experience? And how does it fit into this amazing story that is your story? Yeah, okay. Now you will think that I'm a little bit crazy because I am a scientist. I can uh, assure you of that. But Sometimes there are things, you know, that happen in life that seem a little serendipitous, something beyond of what I can explain. And I remember while I was, you know, right after Heido's death, where I was really in a lot of, you know, emotional anguish, I would say, and where I was really kind of trying to figure out what to do with my life and how to increase my impact, how to do good in this world, how to change something. And then I came up with this idea that you go, I'm a PhD student. And okay, funnily enough, my first season that I went back to Costa Rica for my field work was that season where we found that specific turtle with a plastic straw lodged in its nose. And it's such a silly thing if you think about it in the big scheme of things. I mean, I, you know, I think it's still an incredible tool. It has been an incredible fuel for, you know, the anti-plastic movement, but it also was almost as if like a prayer was answered in a very creative way, right? Because I asked for more impact. We have this turtle. I published this video, not thinking much about it. I wasn't even very social media savvy at that point at all. I had a, I don't even know why I had a YouTube channel. I had a YouTube channel and I didn't have a Facebook because I had a GoFundMe campaign earlier that year. That was like the moment where I opened my Facebook. I don't know, like probably November, December, the year before that, because GoFundMe wanted th that thing to, to do open a, a, an account. So that was the reason I had Facebook. And I mean, this whole thing just blew up and just gifted us this incredible platform all of a sudden to exactly talk about all the horrible things that are happening to our sea turtles, that are happening to our oceans. And instead of, you know, having this experience of kind of being shut down by men of not wanting to listen to me or not having any people that wanted to listen in the first place, I have these now millions of people that kind of follow every of my words and want to know what my opinion is on that topic and want to hear all of our experiences. And yeah, that is kind of the result of this whole video, right? The whole impact that came off it. I mean, it wasn't planned. I don't still, I mean, sometimes people come up to me and ask me like, can you help me to make this video go viral? It's like, if I had the recipe, like I would give it to you, but I have no idea how you could make something go viral. Like I'm, I have no idea, but this video went, went viral and it was just this, yeah. Now it's a little bit weird to see sometimes because people really, you know, reduce you or me to this like one event. And I'm also, again, getting sometimes a little bit annoyed, but it's like, okay, you know, filming a straw and a sea turtle is not all I've done in my life, even though, of course, this is great. I mean, I'm super glad this happened and I'm super glad for all the results, you know, all the countries that pretty much started to think about their plastic consumptions, all the laws that are now in place, uh, how many people were able to use that video when they were talking about those laws. But I mean, this is not everything, right? I mean, this is not where my career is going to stop off <laughs> with a viral video. So, yeah. When did you realize, or, or I, well, I've never had a viral video and I would say most of us haven't. 
when did you realize that it was like a viral thing? And what, what happened? Like, I could imagine being on the receiving end of this. <laughs> well, okay, maybe to like go back. So we have, I mean, it was, a, it was a totally normal day in the field, right? So we were actually collecting data for my PhD. And I had that day uh, visiting, like a friend of mine was visiting. He's also a researcher. At that point, he was really interested in ectobion, so the critters that live on the turtles. We hadn't seen each other in a while, and we had met the night before in a restaurant before going onto the boat the next day. And we kind of were so excited to see each other again, and we were chatting away, and we forgot to tell the waiter to not give us a straw. And so we both got, you know, served the straw, and we were like, oh, shit, you know, the straw. This is such a useless item. Why is it there? Anyways, so then the next day, the 10th of August, 2015, we're on the boat. We're catching turtles. We bring them on the boat. Like I do all my measurements and take the samples. Then he collects all the ectobions. And we do that with, you know, 10, 12 turtles. And so we have the last set of turtles on the boat. And it's this male turtle. And he has something funny encrusted. So I do my spiel again. I'm collecting all the samples. We tag the turtle. And then he's saying, you know what, Chris, I think I'm just going to try to get whatever he has in his nose out. And I'm like, you know what? Could be fun. I'm just going to take a video of it, you know? And so, I mean, you could tell probably from the beginning of the video was kind of lighthearted, stupid, silly comments, you know, about extraction surgery and who knows <laughs> what it is. But we were actually thinking it was like a binacle. And then I actually, my colleague was thinking it's kind of a worm probably that got stuck in there. And then... As we proceed, it's like this thing I can see through like the camera. It's having this like funny black stripes and it's like immediately this like image straw pops up and I'm, you know, but I'm not getting it out because my batteries start flashing red. So I don't know, like I'm asking for spare batteries and we're really worried. Shit, what is this and where is it even leading to? What are we pulling on? Maybe we should cut it off and check out what material is made of. So we cut off a piece of, of, of the thing and my, one of my local assistants actually takes it and bites on it and says, well, that's plastic. Oh. I was like, holy fuck, that's a straw. That is a freaking straw, right? So that's the moment where we like realized, okay, this is like freaking crazy. We have all seen plastic. I mean, we have the necropsies on turtles that were full of plastic. We have pulled plastic out of cloacas. We have removed fishing hooks and fishing line from sea turtles. But that was kind of a first, right? So... We removed the entire thing because we we're like, okay, we're not going to let him like swim away with a freaking plastic straw stuck in its nose. So we remove it. And then my camera turns off. Like actually in the moment that whole thing comes out, my camera just went blank. And I'm like, okay, I don't know until when it actually recorded this whole thing. So I got the spare batteries, but the spare batteries were also not charged. I was like, okay, shit. So I guess it's going to be a surprise. We kind of just, you know, disinfected it. And then he was pretty happy to just get away. He was pretty feisty. So we released him. He was happy to swim away. And we we're making our way back to the, to the harbor, which was like about two or three hours away. And we're like just sitting in silence. Nobody talks. And I remember everybody just kind of, you know, kind of, yeah, just like it's lost in their own thoughts. But every time somebody's, you know, when you just kind of meet each other's eye and we have, everybody's just like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> And so we get home to our like our headquarters where, where my team was living. And I pull out the SD cards and we're all like gathering around the laptop, right? And just like, okay, fast forward, fast forward. Okay, that is still recorded. That is still recorded. We get to the point where he pulls it out and you can see, oh, okay, at least he recorded like until the moment it was pulled out and he holds it up and that was it. Like that was the whole video. And honestly, the only thing, it was just like, I think we actually debated. I was like, you know what? I said, I'm just going to upload it as is. I don't have time to really cut it. Also, honestly, I hate these like super heavily edited videos. This is how it was. And this is how it is. All my cursing in the background. I love, I like authenticity. I was like, this is what it is. The only thing I did was I sent a, I actually sent an email to my professor. I said, look, this happened do you have a problem with me uploading it as is? And she's like, no, people need to see how it is. So I uploaded, or like I put it to upload on YouTube. We were 
um, actually not having Wi-Fi where we were living. So we had to go to this really fancy pizza place to eat one <laughs> night to steal their Wi-Fi password that would get like all the way to our like accommodations. So I'm logging onto this like Wi-Fi and I can already see, okay, it's like hours that it will take to upload. So I just put it on to upload and I'm going back to sleep because next morning, four o'clock, my alarm will ring and we will be back on the boat without internet connection, without cell phone connection. So I get up in the morning and the only thing is I do is I just check, okay, video uploaded, fine, close the laptop, we're heading off to the boat. And my friend isn't even on the boat that day. Uh, he kind of went back to his own thing. And yeah, so I'm coming back that night and I can see there's already like 2000 views on the, on the video. And I make a, I make a Facebook post about it. And I'm remembering I sent like kind of a Facebook message to my professor and I'm joking. It's like, oh, our video is going all viral. Like, <laughs> ha ha. Right. <laughs> And I leave it, like I do the Facebook post and I, again, I'm heading off onto the boat. I'm gone, no internet. And I'm coming back and this whole thing has exploded. I mean, I don't even remember exactly the increments, but it was literally from like a few thousands to like 50,000 to 500,000 to like a few millions. And then different, you know, Facebook accounts picked it up. There was like, I don't know, do you remember? this lion that got shot by this dentist. Mm -hmm. yes, um, so there lion. was this account that was somehow called like so and so many signatures for Cecil or so, I don't know, or against this dude, I don't remember. So he published it or they published it. And I'm opening my email boxes and I'm just having thousands of emails from like different media outlets, right? Washington Post, National Geographic, Time Magazine. No, Time Magazine was actually not with that one of the first ones, but all of them are just like half past. They're all writing us. And I'm like, yeah, I, I have really shitty internet. We can try to have like a phone call or like I can answer some questions. Some of them I was already too late because I had been spending my entire day on the boat. And so he got his information. They got the information elsewhere. But yeah, it just was two weeks of craziness. Two weeks that was just absolutely insane. I learned a lot about copyright infringement during those two weeks <laughs> and um, yeah, some other skills as well. It was really interesting. Of course, also all the very ugly comments of people accusing us of having shoved that straw up that turtle's nose so we can pull it out. And I don't know, I mean, all kinds of kind of funny stuff, but also a lot of weird and not so pleasant stuff. But yeah, that was... The whole viral thing and then it kind of died down as most things do right nowadays stories don't live very long and then there was the next wave that kind of came and that was when all the ngos and all the movements or people that worked already on the plastic issue started approaching me and asking me if they could use the video for you know their campaigns and whatever so that was kind of the next big thing and then, of course, I think I would say, kind of say it was like oscillating. And then there was like these big things all of a sudden when people, when the UN started to talk about plastic, when uh, the new Blue Planet came out and it was against plastic. And so there was always these, you know, kind of short revivals of the video. And then, of course, when the law started to trickle and when countries starting to pledge, hey, we're going to ban straws or cutlery or whatever else. And... You know, when Disney and Starbucks and Alaska Airlines started to say, well, we stopped serving straws, um, that was actually, I think, the summer 2018. So that was almost three years later. In the meantime, there was also a documentary that had come out on the straws topic. Um, yeah, that was kind of when, you know, the things started building and building up. And I mean, I just tried to do my part, being a PhD student, not having a lot of time, just attending to people, right, that... I mean, I got so many emails from young kids that wanted to do something. And so I started coaching them of like, how can they start their own campaign in their school? Uh, how to ban straws in their cafeteria? Um, I went on to different panels and all of that jazz. So there was like a lot of outreach that I was able to do and talk about. And of course, people also started to notice, okay, you are actually not able to just talk about straws. You have a lot of knowledge about sea turtles as well. And so, yeah, I was able to talk about all of that, right? Everything that sea turtles concern and what we should do better. 
I was able to touch up on and, and yeah, I felt that people were listening and trying to make a difference afterwards. Yeah. Is now the plastic crisis one of your big missions? Is, is that one of the big things you're working towards now? Or what, is, what would you say is your number one? Well, I mean, my number one is always sea turtles, right? Well, right, right. Um, of what happens or what the issues for sea turtles are, I think that defines a little bit of where I'm concentrating on. But I have to say, naturally, the pl plastic pollution is definitely one of the fights that I have picked. I don't, you know, I hate when people try to play. I and mean, there's so many things that go wrong on our planet, in our oceans. It's not just one thing. It's a whole array of apocalyptical writers that have these incredible, horrible synergies. I mean, plastic pollution feeds directly into climate change of, for the reasons of how it is manufactured, of how it degrades and all of that. But the thing is, though, you cannot work on all those issues. You know, you have to, you have to pick your fights. You only have, again, you only have a finite amount of time. You only have a finite amount of energy. So you need to decide, okay, where do you put your energies? And for me, just because of my story of my journey, it was plastic pollution. And also because it's something so tangible. And I also feel while it is something so horrible, it is also something that so many people can relate on an individual level and really feel like they can make a difference every single day of their lives, right? So that means even though you're stuck at home during a pandemic, you know, I might not be able to come out and help me directly in Costa Rica save sea turtles, but you can still make your or do your bit from home, right? That's that's the beauty I feel with the plastic pollution issue. It's really a little bit in our hands still. I mean, it's also beyond manufacturers yeah. and politics and all of that. But again, we can vote. We can vote for politicians. We can also vote for manufacturers with our money, right? So again, there's a certain empowerment of consumers. Right, right. Absolutely. And just like you said, it's something that we can do, all of us can do. And why I think that video is so powerful in that sense, where it's like somebody used that straw and that straw got into the sea turtle's nose because of that one person used that straw. And that could have been anybody. That could, have, could been, have been you. That could have been I, because none exactly. of us exactly say that we have never, ever used a plastic straw. Right. And so to right. see the consequences, like very tangibly to see the consequences was very impactful. And, and just even from that alone, I worked, um, my, the last company I worked for is called Natural Habitat Adventures. And they're a fantastic conservation travel company. And they did everything possible to ban straws and as many destinations as possible. We went to every single continent. And like, that just from that one, that one video and yeah, anti-straw movement. Let's go. Let's hop on the bandwagon. There's some really good bandwagons that can come from that. And then you could talk about plastic bags and all these other problems that you see in the ocean. So it's just amazing what that one video can do. Just that one, you, you saw this every day. Like you said, like you're doing a crop season, like all of these sea turtles were filled with plastic and I guess what I would like to ask next on that, I mean, have you seen a difference? Is, is it any better in our oceans from someone who's on the water every day with these animals? What's the update? <laughs> What's the update? I would say, unfortunately, at this point, the plastic pollution is really a crisis and it's not getting better because we haven't managed to turn off the tap, right? So this is the thing. Because, I mean, the important thing is, I mean, there are so many people that criticize this whole movement for, oh, straws are not the major problem. Well, it was never meant to be just about the straws, right? But if you can envision that a tiny object such as a straw can cause so much pain and suffering, can you envision how more and larger objects, what type of suffering they can cause? And this is full of it. I mean, our project just this season pulled off 630 kilograms of plastic from the beach. That is just one beach cleanup per week. Yeah, that's not even that much, but it's just so much. And it's right there and it's coming back. So we clean it up. The next flood, it's so the next tide is going to, you know, pretty much makes it look as if we never went out to clean. So it's just, it's, it's sissy for us, right? Unless we have laws in place 
that incentivize big manufacturers to change something drastically about how they package their food, how they manufacture certain things. But we as consumers also need to demand change, right? We need to create a different type of demand, a demand that is pretty much for products that do not contain plastic. And that is actually probably the positive where I feel, where I see the change is there are so many more options of plastic-free products everywhere. I mean, here in Costa Rica, in Germany, in the US even, I mean, you can get everything in something else. I mean, you don't have to buy plastic anymore. You can buy it in glass, you can buy it in aluminum, you can buy it in paper, or you can buy it completely unpacked and bring your own containers. And I felt that did not exist in that extent maybe five or six years ago. And I feel it's it's increasing because people are becoming more aware. And especially, I would say my generation, your generation, even the younger generation, we just don't mindlessly consume anymore, right? So we really like to invest our money in companies that try to make it better. They may try to, you know, I mean, I don't blame people for wanting to make money, but you cannot make that on the cost of our livelihood on our planet of the, you know, of killing animals, of devastating our environment, our air, our water. I think this is not okay anymore. And people have come to realize that. And I just hope that those products that are not, you know, made from plastic that contain PFAS and all, all these really bad also for us human health, really hazardous materials. I just hope that it doesn't stay a privilege because I feel it's still a privilege. A lot of times it's more expensive. And so people that, you know, are social, like economically not super well off, they still don't have the option to buy healthier options, right? So they have to buy stuff in plastic and so I just hope it becomes not a privileged thing anymore. I hope it becomes mainstream because the big manufacturers, right? If we talk Coca-Cola and Nestle and all of those main polluters really come to realize that the world is demanding a different kind of product. Yeah, absolutely. And I do feel like there's a movement too, just like you said, like so many more companies are becoming so much more eco-conscious and like this sense where when you were saying that I was immediately thinking about fast fashion, how our generation is pretty much like, sorry, H and M sorry, forever 21. I, I don't support you. I will spend the extra money. If I have it, I will save up to spend the extra money to get that really nice, like that really nice product to support that company that I know has green practices or as I mostly do, I just buy secondhand. From everybody else who's spent all their money on astronomical clothes. I'm like, thank you. I'm going to get that off my goodwill rack for three bucks, you know? And, <laughs> and I, I feel like it's way more acceptable. Like that's no longer seen as, because I mean, when I was growing up to have secondhand clothes was not a good thing. You know, no, it was, of course not. no, absolutely mm -hmm. not. It was kind of looked down upon. You were poor. You were kind of exactly. Yeah. Luckily, my parents were always a little bit stingy. So <laughs> we like were wearing the clothes from like my male cousins a lot of times. So it was just like, I was never cool, clothes wise at least um, when I grew up, probably also in any other way. But yeah, I think it becomes more in vogue to be pro environment. You know, I, I think it's, I mean, I remember when I grew up also that I was collecting signatures against whaling. Everybody made fun of me. It's like, oh yeah, Chris, the whales, right? The whales need your help. Ha ha ha. I don't think anybody would ever laugh at people nowadays. No. And I see the young generation investing their time into environmental topics. They're actually cool, really popular kids, right? And I yeah. think this is great that it becomes, you know, that you kind of become the ass if you're actually, you know, a polluter and you're not very vogue in this sense. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's almost like a badge of pride because I can right, be like, exactly. like my outfit was secondhand, you know. Like, right. just look at me. I was like, look at my ass in these jeans right now. Want to know where I got them? Goodwill, you know. It's like, yeah, it's, it's like it's something to be proud of. And you know, vintage things are so in style, and and I love where the consumerism is going right now. I do too, and I mean, 
I just love, I mean, I was, I went to this really fancy gala dinner once um, and everybody of course felt, I felt I was so kind of out of place because it was all these Hollywood actors, you know, they had their probably private stylists and their amazing dresses and whatever. But then I was seated next to somebody and I was like, oh my God, you have such a nice dress. I was actually then a secondhand dress. Like you said, like I had it bought, um, I forgot the name, but it was like this, like one of those stores that kind of started popping up a few years ago where you can, you know, even online shop secondhand dresses. And that she was actually, oh yeah, I rent my dresses. That's not my dress. Like I don't spend money on dresses. So I'm just renting it. And I was like, that's cool. That is actually <laughs> really, really cool. I never knew about that before, but I got educated right there. So I just think, and she was so open about it, you know, that I thought, okay, this is cool. That's obviously not an issue, right? You can openly admit to having a rented dress and actually <laughs> probably being congratulated for that. <laughs> get the social brownie points actually now as opposed Probably, to the other way right. around yeah so, so I yeah love when, we, when we chatted on the phone you said that you you really love applied science which is one of the ways that you went down your path and I'm also very action oriented because we can talk until we're blue in the face but unless we don't have something concrete to do then what's the point so for anybody listening, or, or me, or you, or anyone else, what would you say is an actionable thing that we can do? What is maybe one or two tips that you, in your eyes, would really help with this problem? I mean, I always feel, again, like you have to pick your fights, right? I mean, I hate to advertise anything that's perfect. I mean, I don't think I'm perfect. And I really hate people that are sitting on such a high horse that it's so untangible. I mean, you can't reach them, you know, that it's, it's too perfect. So I would just say that look around in your household and try to identify everything that you still consume. I mean, look at your, literally look at your waste bin and see how much waste you're creating and what that is mainly made from, right? So if you have a lot of plastic items, where are those plastic items come, coming from? Is it your shampoo bottle? Is it your, I don't know, your guilty pleasures from your microwavable, microwavable uh, dinner meal or something like that? I mean, just pick maybe three items and say, you know what? I'm just going to look for more sustainable options. And what I actually did is I challenged myself in 2017, I think it was, for one year to pretty much cancel one more item, plastic item out of my life. Um, so I kind of looked around in my household and just said, okay, after I'm done using this, what else could I use that is not made from plastic? I mean, at that point, of course, I used already like, you know, reusable water bottles. I already had a coffee mug to go. I definitely brought my own shopping bags, uh, all of that. Just, but it was more of kind of like, what else am I creating consistently, right? And so for me as a woman, it was a lot of cosmetic cosmetic, cosmetic products. So face cream, shampoo, conditioner, but also cleaning products, um, you know, in, in, in the house cleaning, then also the uh, waste bin bags, you know, the, the big massive plastic bags that we put in our waste bins to hold our plastic trash. So all of those things, I decided, you know what, I can think of better ways and find better products that are not plastic. And most of them actually stayed with me. I mean, here in Costa Rica, it's sometimes a little bit more challenging to find certain things because we don't have a supermarket just around the corner. So we have to buy in bulk. And then again, we don't have stores where you can come with your own containers or we actually have to, you know, it's really hot and humid. So things just don't stay fresh long enough for months if I don't have it wrapped in plastic. So that's sometimes a little bit disappointing, but I think we're still pretty good compared to, to other people, right? So I don't drink sodas, for example, unless I can find them in a glass bottle, those kind of things. Or I'm, I felt during the pandemic, one of my biggest challenges was actually looking at takeout food containers. Yes, me too. And finding <laughs> restaurants that do not give plastic, but rather paper. And I just, once I knew who that was, I actually called them up and asked. <laughs> I just kept on ordering with them. I was like, okay, cool. Like what you do, you get my money. <laughs> and I think this is just how everybody should approach it. Probably. I don't think there's like a one fits all kind of recommendation, 
I just think it like, you know, kind of analyze where your plastic comes from and how much trash you create, plastic trash especially, and how you can find other solutions to that. And I really love those tips. And one of the main reasons why is you said one item at a time. Like you don't have to go into your pantry right now and just get rid of everything and try to find a solution all at once. That's so overwhelming. And then you're going to feel so disappointed when you have to get that next plastic item because you haven't yet done the research to get a sustainable option or something. So I really love those. I really love those tips. And also too, during the pandemic, I mean, I love to use reusable bags and go buy things in bulk and that was literally removed. Like you could not do that. They put bulk items in plastic bags. I'm yeah. like, son of a bitch. Like, yeah, <laughs> it yeah, was a I long know. time. It's, it's super. I mean, I feel the pandemic has definitely increased the plastic consumption because I mean, I remember walking through Houston airport and they, I'm shitting you not, they wrapped the entire like bars and chairs oh in like this like um thin plastic foil thingy right that i don't even use like entire like the, they wrapped the entire businesses in just plastic and i was like what the fuck i mean what is that even supposed to accomplish yeah the germs are going to be on the plastic so just as much as going to be on the surface <laughs> yeah it's oh my god it's just yeah i mean the pandemic is definitely not helping the issue. I mean, also PPEs, right? I mean, reusable, non-reusable masks are definitely an issue because they're non-recyclable. Our waste streams are totally overwhelmed by them. Luckily, in the US, you can use reusable masks. They did take that option away in Europe, which I really hated when I went to Europe. I didn't know about that. But I think that's another thing, right? It's just like get a good reusable mask, make like a double layer mask, make one that fits really well. I mean, there's so many options that are so much better than those surgical masks that you can like throw away and they don't even fit well. And yeah, so I think there's definitely ways of even during the pandemic of of trying to um, do a good job of, of, of not creating too much plastic waste. I mean, like I said, it's not perfect, right? But the thing is, I think we all need to try. We really do. Yeah. And if everybody or if as many people as possible are just changing their habits just slightly in the positive direction, just imagine the impact on scale that would have. So even if it's just one item you're changing, now imagine if you told your friend and that friend started changing or your family, like it's a ripple effect. And so even if it might be one small item, to you, whoever's listening, like it could really have a whole downstream effect in a very positive way. Absolutely. I mean, I was, when I go and talk to school kids, I'm always saying, okay, how many people do we have sitting here? I don't know. Let it be 60 kids, right? Or maybe it's a uh, hundred kids. Okay. If everybody of you drinks one bottle of Coke every single day of the year, that's 365 bottles of Cokes times 100, right? I mean, just think about it. You just don't drink it. That's a massive amount of plastic that just doesn't happen. I mean, this is just, you know, it's, it's really about not, I mean, even if you as a family, I mean, that's the other thing. It's like, okay, just think about it. You go grocery shopping once a week. And I mean, in the US, I've seen it so many times. You're coming on with what, 20 of those like super flimsy plastic bags, 50 times a year. Like how many plastic bags, you know, hundreds of them did you not use if you bring your own shopping bags? And, you know, I think I just hated so much the inconvenience or like people avoid the inconvenience. If it's inconvenient, people tend to not do it. And I think we need to snap out of that. We really need to. I mean, we don't have another option. Have you actually, okay, have you seen already the new film with Leonardo DiCaprio on Netflix, Don't Look Up? Oh my gosh, no, I haven't, but okay, I, I don't really want to spoil it. Oh my okay, god. Okay, don't spoil it, feels. please. <laughs> I'm not gonna spoil it, but all the feels. I mean, this whole film is about, you know, science, how scientific facts are getting denied because people can't live with the truth. Mm. And you know, it hits home in so many ways. I mean, it hits home when we talk about climate change, even when we talk about the pandemic, right? All the misinformation about 
vaccines and of what type of signs and if governments, it's just so horrible. And as a scientist, it's so frustrating to see this, that people cannot accept facts for what they are. Because, I mean, as a scientist, we get trained that our worldview changes if there's new data available, right? And only then, and only if the data says something else than whatever else we thought before, right? And I mean, we stay flexible, yes, but we just kind of not shake any kind of, if we, it's not like we're going to deny the truth just because we don't want it to be true, right? And so, yeah, I think, especially when we talk about climate change, there's so much that needs to be done that has to do with people. Yes, they cannot continue as we have done in the past. We all have to be inconvenienced, but it shouldn't matter if we will have a future on this planet. This is what I sometimes don't get, right? But um, yeah. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. It's like, this is your planet too. I don't understand. I mean, I it's really hard to change habits. And I feel the exact same way about science. I'm like, can someone show me the data and what statistics were run on that data and who funded the information? Then we can get an answer. <laughs> well, and if it was peer reviewed, right? Because yes. that's the thing, right? I mean, peer reviewed process is not perfect maybe, but it is definitely a quality control. Mm -hmm. And I think, Scientists definitely, I mean, if have you ever published, have you ever received review or comments? They're assholes. I mean, they really <laughs> are not nice. They are not trying to make your study become published on, you know, whatever. I mean, they really trying to trip you over and make you feel bad about yourself and doubt about everything you've done while you studied that thing. So Knowing that about peer review process and, you know, knowing of how scientists discuss amongst each other, it is so ridiculous when people come up with this like conspiracy theory that all the scientists are in on it and are all getting funded by the big pharma companies. It's just such a bullshit, you know, <laughs> it really is. Ah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. We shouldn't start with that topic because I'm getting really about <laughs> people not accepting or like not even understanding science. That is what really gets me. I mean, so oh Lord, yeah, science literacy is so important, and I hope if we haven't learned anything after that pandemic, that at least the different countries realize that they need to invest into science education in school. Hardcore. Hardcore. Yes. And to switch topics a little bit, there is a particular topic that you and I chatted quite a lot about when we had our yeah. phone call that speaking of just getting things out in the open, it was a BuzzFeed article that was called Welcome to the Jungle, the Smithsonian's hashtag me too moment. And I know you've experienced a lot being a woman in a male-dominated field, running your own organization, being in a culture that also sees women as inferior. And I would love to take this time to chat about that. And if you would be comfortable and whatever you're comfortable with sharing on what you've seen and what you've experienced, just to help educate all of us on maybe what it's actually like to go to these places, to go somewhere where you are a different skin tone, where you are maybe the inferior, quote unquote, gender. And yeah, just anything that you are open to sharing about that, please, please enlighten all of us. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's really funny because I'm even growing up in Germany, I think it was always, even though I had only sisters, which was interesting. And you know, a lot of stuff that happened to me in my childhood with adults, maybe not taking me seriously or not listening or in school when I got frustrated because I just said something and then a guy raised his hand and said the exact same thing. But for some reason, as if I've never said it, he was congratulated for the information. And I mean, I'm sure you have this experience that most of us women have. You know what? I think in the very beginning, I didn't even realize that it might've been a thing about gender because I... You know, I didn't grow up with a male other than my father in my house. And 
even though he was, so for example, he had his thing with blonde, blonde jokes. I don't know if that's a thing in the US. So blondes are considered stupid. Oh, definitely Europe. a thing in the US. Hence we're both and blondes. So we're always receiving. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I'm also like in my family, not everybody's blonde. Actually in every generation they have, we have like one blonde. So my aunt is blonde. I'm blonde. I don't know if there's like some other blondes like farther back, but the thing is though, like my mom and dad are both not blonde and neither are my two sisters. I mean, one of my sisters is new blonde, but not really blonde. So I think because of my dad making so many jokes, I was always super conscious of the fact that I'm blonde and that people might think I'm stupid. And I remember going to university, I was so aware of that fact that I definitely made efforts of, for example, dressing up in a certain way. For example, if I ever had to go to a oral, like an examination where you're, well, an exam, not an examination, an exam, like where you're actually getting tested on something. Oh God, that sounded horrible right now. Sorry, <laughs> non-native speaker. Um, <laughs> exam where you kind of, you know, there was a male professor. So guess what? Turtleneck and glasses. That was like how I rolled, right? Because I did not want to be perceived at anything but brains. You know, I wanted to also not being told as like, oh, you just got that because you're a woman or whatever, right? I hated those kind of comments. And well, then coming to Costa Rica, of course, and being surrounded, first of all, being an attraction, right? Being here, a blonde woman, a taller woman also. I mean, I'm not super tall for German standards, but here in that country, I'm taller than most men actually, or like just about the same height. So it doesn't matter where I go, like I'm getting cat whistles, I'm getting commented on, you know, people give weird comments. And that is one thing. And I mean, I, I think I'm a pretty tough cookie. I worked as a lifeguard also with a lot of men and I had to listen to a lot of shit stuff, you know, from people and guests and whatever. So I think over the years I've grown a pretty tough skin. But this was a different caliber here because it was also my professional life, right? So I had to work with guys and I had to work with male bosses. So I think luckily I was very good about kind of blocking and being very defining or very kind of, you know, firm about advances, physical advances. I mean, even being in Egypt, that was actually something that was very super uncomfortable. Um, I mean, it started out funny because my professor actually used me and the other blonde in the group to smuggle stuff in the airport into Egypt, <laughs> like kind of books and sampling vials. So we got one suitcase, we got stopped, you know, I don't know, seven Egyptian guys were standing around us and just stopped us because we're blonde and wanted to look into our suitcase while my professor with all the like questionable items kind of walked past them unnoticed. But then being there was also, you know, it doesn't, like even in the dive base, people were trying to help you into your wetsuit, um, very touchy, touchy. Um, we got like beautiful flower creations on in our rooms. It was unfortunately also the two blondes that shared a room right there. Nobody else got that. And I remember, I mean, I just was very firm from the beginning. I said like, I don't want the help in the wetsuit. I don't want this, I don't want that. But my friend, who I think was probably more raised in a way that women are not supposed to say no or like, you know, how. So she didn't say anything. She felt uncomfortable. We talked about it. And then, of course, it became more and more. We actually have a German word for it. It's called übergriffig. It means like quite literally when somebody like grabs or it's like goes beyond with the grab, if that makes sense. I love that word because it's so literal of what it means like in so many different instances because it's not always like physical it can also be with words but it became more and more kind of a progression right up until there was really some stuff where like boobs and butts were touched and beyond that and I was like you can't let that happen I'm sorry like this is not okay and so we had to talk to our professor and he he kind of you know went to the boss of the hotel and the dive base and it stopped but even being put into that place was horrible or when we went into town I literally could not go with male companions and then even being with a male companion he would like get offered like oh that's really all oh, beautiful wife you have there like how many camels did you pay for her you want to come in my store pictures were taken of me it was very you know I hated to be reduced to that because I'm a smart person and I hated to just be kind of this 
objectified person. And then being back in Costa Rica was kind of the same thing, right? It was, again, like this very openly sleazy male approaches that were okay. And I don't have, I can, luckily I can say I never experienced anything but, but I'm also thinking sometimes, I don't know what would have happened if I wouldn't be the person I am and kind of put a stop onto it immediately. Because I know I have gotten in the past a lot of comments about when I say, you know what, I'm not interested, fuck off. Like, oh, you've got to stick up your ass. Like, so what? I don't fucking care. Like, then I have a stick up my ass. Like, I don't, what are you trying? Like blackmailing me into whatever? No. But the thing is, was still that, you know, I would get comments, for example, I remember very well, like one of my bosses sat down with me and he was like, well, Chris, I know you are the biologist in charge, but men around here don't like to be told by a woman of how to do things. So you have to kind of dial back the whole thing. Like you have to make them like believe it's their own idea and you have to beat a little bit more around the bush and kind of just don't have to be so forceful. You know, you're a woman, just remember that. Be act more like a woman. And I remember that over the years, I tried to adjust so much to that concept that I almost lost a little bit of sense of who I am as a person, which was also very, very sad because I was like, what the hell am I doing? This is not me. This is not what I believe in. This is not how I react. And honestly, that was also a good thing that I was able to go back, at least for a few months, back to Germany, kind of connect back to my roots, also going to the US and having kind of like, you know, my compass reset also for what is normal and what is not normal. And just because everybody tells me that this is normal and this is how men act and this is how women should act, but this is not always the normal that it needs to be, right? But it is, of course, we live in a bubble here, right? So I live in rural towns where most men and women maybe finish high school, but where women still get pregnant at a very early age. It's not unusual to be pregnant with 15, 14, even 13 years old. Wow. Um, where, you know, you're getting told by your mom, hey, you don't need to be smart. Just be, don't show them that you're so smart. Just be pretty. Then you find a man that takes care of you. And then you see this vicious circle of like domestic violence, women being financially absolutely dependent, not being able to leave those vicious circles. And then having me as a more than educated woman, right? I mean, I have degree wise pretty much reached everything that you could have reached. I don't have children. I have my own money and I don't need a man. Like, I mean, if if I want to be with a man, it's for different reason than for being, you know, with him with for money. And so this is something that a lot of people don't really understand and don't relate to. And for me, it's very difficult sometimes as well, because when I moved to Costa Rica, I was very used to having male friends as well. But here, it's everything super separated. Women on this side, men on this side. There's not real friendships, right? And kind of women have their one dimension of life and men have the other dimension of life. And of course, over the years, I've also seen this übergriffige from you know, those men that it can definitely result into way more horrible things, right? And that other women, maybe their thresholds or their like thick skin is not as thick as mine. And they feel very offended. And honestly, I think probably a lot of things that I had to get used to is probably considered sexual, sexual molestation, sexual whatever, right? It's not normal. And Luckily, even here in Costa Rica, times are changing a little bit. So there's laws now that even cat whistling, in theory at least, could be punished with prison, with a lawsuit and so on. But I think it's not just like the laws, right? I mean, there has to be cultural change as well. And it has to be also women that realize that it's okay to say no to men. Like, it's not okay that a man touches you. It is not okay if a man pressures you into doing anything, but, but if you want to work in this field, you also have to realize that you will be confronted with that. That world is not perfect yet, right? And I, I mean, as much as, of course, like I'm a female boss, I always talk to my people and I say, okay, it doesn't matter if it's my, if it's my brother or my father or my whatever friend, if that person is doing something to you, tell me, and I will do something about it because this is not okay. As a woman, 
I will stand behind you. But having male bosses and having also had situations where, you know, where people were somehow really sexually molested, sexually assaulted, and then having to hear, like I was not the person, the victim, but having to listen to these male bosses questioning even, well, are you sure that you didn't send the wrong signals? Is so frustrating and so highly wrong. But this is unfortunately still the reality. And I think things like that happen in the Smithsonian are just scratching the surface, to be quite honest. Just scratching the surface. I mean, this is just like, you know, and I, I still think that so many women are probably very worried if they would talk about and name names, what would happen to their careers. Absolutely. Yeah. And just like you said, it's, it's definitely something that if, I mean, <laughs> even if somebody of a, one of you is listening, who's 18, you're not even in your career yet. I'm sure at some point you've probably experienced something that Chris is talking about, which is why we need to keep having this conversation because there's clearly a disconnect between what we're receiving and what's acceptable and what boys are growing up and thinking as is acceptable as well. And then maybe if the conversation keeps going and we all hear the narrative of how much it hurts each other, then hopefully it'll slow, slow down, or at least the conversation will start being had that no, that's not appropriate. And maybe let's, let's, let's start a dialogue of, of why that's not appropriate in these two contexts. What, what is super important though, is, I mean, we women are unfortunately part of the problem as well, because we always, I mean, first of all, we always act as if there's just one, one seat at the table for one of us, right? Which is totally not true. I mean, just because we, they would suggest that it is that way, that doesn't mean we have to accept it as such, right? As soon as we are in a position as a woman to reach down and create more seats, we should definitely do it. The other thing, it even starts in the small. I mean, in so many cases where, I mean, I remember, for example, I was still a student, I went to a dance party and a guy grabbed my ass, like full blown, grabbed my ass. I turned around and I hit him straight in the face with my fist. Awesome. But guess what my friends were saying? They were actually embarrassed for me creating such a scene. Yeah. I mean, I love them dearly, but for them, it was like, oh my God, couldn't you just like, it was uncomfortable. Everybody felt uncomfortable, right? So, and I have experienced that so many times. I mean, I can also, there was another case where a colleague of mine was actually, you know, assaulted by her professor and she was not the only one, but when she came forward and said, okay, it happened to this woman, it happened to this woman, it happened to this woman, none of the women actually stood up and supported her story. Wow. You know, so it's just like, we need to, we need to support each other and we need to stop. I mean, have you ever noticed there is this bromance shit going on between men? It's like this cool dudes that just kind of invite other cool dudes. I mean, it's also a podcast thing to be quite honest. And then they have the dude fest, you know, it's so like bro and bro. And it's so exclusive because it means we women are not included immediately. So okay, but why do we not have something similar as women? Right? I mean, right. if it's acceptable for men to exclude us, why can we not do something? I mean, we don't even have to exclude anybody, but at least lift each other up. I mean, we're not in competition. And we are smart. We are incredible, capable. And we don't have to be jealous of each other, right? I mean, in, on the contrary, we, we, would, we need to celebrate each other. We need to uplift each other and we need to help each other in those situations. Because everybody knows those stories that are kind of whispered into each other's ears, like, hey, watch out for that person. He's kind of like, you know, touchy, touchy and don't get too close. And maybe you want to rethink if you want to take a class with this guy. We all know those stories. So you know, if it's already kind of whispered, so why don't we speak up collectively as women, right? And kind of cancel those people out. Yeah. That is kind of the thing. So if you're in a position, especially if your career is not in danger, 
you should definitely not be the person that punishes other women for being women, toughen them up or whatever else your motivations are, but freaking reach out, be a stepping stone, help them to get where you are. Yeah. Yes. It just needs to be shouted from the rooftops because I am very tired of the women against women thing or like working in, I'm very lucky now that I work in an pretty much an all women office and everybody's amazing. That is literally the first time I've ever experienced that in my life. Cause most of the time when I'm working, usually the biggest bitches are the women. And I'm like, but I just want to love you. <laughs> and I know that sounds so petty, but that, that's the truth. It's just like, I want us to be friends. Like I want to uplift you just as much as I want you to uplift me and vice versa. And like, even this podcast, having as many women on as possible. And then of course, men too, because there's amazing, uh, there's amazing people both ways that have great stories, but not one is better than the other. It's like, I want you on here because you're an amazing human and you have a message that needs to be shared. It's not because of your XY chromosome or whatever, you know, <laughs> which, which it feels like, especially in our field, especially traveling and I mean, yeah, just, and it's traveling places and yeah, I just really love that you took the time to take this to one, share your experience, share what other women have experienced. And also, yeah, it is on us too. Yeah. I don't want to go too much. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's just sometimes challenges also the worldviews and the principles you have, right? I mean, you have of course you adapt to certain things. And I mean, I hate, I don't want to always be judgmental of culture, right? Because we all carry our cultural albatross and there is not sometimes a right or wrong. It's just like, okay, I grew up believing in this and these people grew up with this and they believe in this. And so with the time you kind of understand where they're coming from, but there's certain things, especially when it goes about gender roles and whatever that have consistently really clashed with my very, very ingrained ideas about life. And I still don't know how to always handle those things other than I just can't accept it. I mean, there's certain things I just can't accept it. For example, I mean, another common thing here in Costa Rica is really, it's like people kind of play the three monkeys. They don't see, they don't hear, they don't say. And so when somebody beats up his wife or girlfriend, and you can hear it, right? Our house is all kind of made from wood. So you can hear the screams and nobody really goes and checks and helps. And then there's actually comments like, well, she asked for it. You know, she's really nasty or whatever. And I'm just saying, there's never a reason in the fucking world to freaking hit your wife. It doesn't matter. Then walk away. Honestly, I mean, if she's that nasty, if she's that annoying, then just walk away. That's the easiest way. And yeah, or for example, there is this professor at the local high school that is raping girls. He has already had, yeah, gotten several students pregnant. He actually got a lawsuit. He was suspended for a while. Now there's another lawsuit and people were just kind of shocking. It's like, yeah, well, maybe she's lying about it. It's like, you see the pattern, right? There is a pattern. It's not like one person saying this thing, but there's actually a pattern that has been going on for years. So that person very likely is doing what he's doing. So why the heck is he still a professor, right? This is things that I have a very hard time accepting. I, do, I just can't. I mean, that's the bottom line. I just can't. I mean, I have to live with it because I won't be able to change it. But um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, yes. Thanks so much for exploring that. And I think the big moral of the story there is if you are a woman and or you're with women and you know this is happening, do not be afraid to say something and no, no get yourself no. out of the situation. Like, right. please don't put yourself through that. Just no. get away, change your situation, tell who you need to tell. Don't let it happen again. <laughs> if, if you have any way to like not let it happen again. And honestly, no career in the world is worth of, you know, staying in a situation that is somehow related to sexual assault or somehow tit for tat. I don't know. I mean, you will be able to get elsewhere, better career and better bosses. And obviously be way happier because that's not happening anymore. Right. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. full circle. 
Your career right. won't yeah. be over. You'll just go somewhere right. else and have a much better time. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> okay. Yes. Definitely wanted to chat about that for a while. And I'd love, I just love your viewpoint on it too. And the messages just speak up and support each other. I feel our whole talk is not very lighthearted though. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's good. Well, let's get, let's get back to a, a very upbeat thing. So let's talk about your organization now. So you said that finally, so let, let's get the timeline, right? So 2013 was when this big thing happened. We had this whole life switch, went and got your PhD. 2015, your viral video came out. 2020, your life has come full circle and you're now doing a sea turtle project on your original beach for, you know, you're amazing turtles. So amazing leatherback turtles. So let, let's talk about that. What is your project? What are you, what are you doing and how's it going and launching it in a pandemic? <laughs> How'd yeah, that go? <laughs> not as planned. Yeah. So, um, kind of going back a little bit. So the beach that we're working on, like where our main project is right now. So we have some recent projects also still on the Pacific, which you know, because of the pandemic are not happening as they um, should. But our main project right now is a conservation project in the Southern Caribbean. It's the same project that I started in 16 years ago. And unfortunately, it was discontinued in 2010 uh, because of a conflict with the organization and the village that used to have the project. And so when we found it, in 2014, the idea was really to revive Gandoka because first of all, Ariana, the president by my former mentee is from Gandoka. So our, several of our board members as well. And of course, there's like this emotional connection, you know, to, to the beach. It's a beautiful area. It used to have a lot of turtles. Yeah, I didn't kind of work the first years because I didn't have enough time. We had funding, but there were other obstacles. But then 2019 came, I got offered funding and I was like, okay, it's now and ever, we're going to try this whole thing. And yeah, lo and behold, we started, of course, the pandemic hit, but at that point I already had the funding. So it didn't go as badly as other projects. And the cool thing about Gandoka is we are in, in a protected area in a wildlife refuge in Costa Rica. And we do have three different species of sea turtles that come to lay their eggs. And we also have seagrass beds and coral reefs where sea turtles are eating in. And historically, the project that existed here was, yeah, focusing on leatherbacks, so the biggest of all sea turtle species. And in the past years, though, people have started to tell us that it seems to be that the hawksbill turtle is nesting in really big quantities, bigger than usually. I mean, we always, you know, had a certain amount, usually less than 20 nests per year of hawksbill turtles. Hawksbills are actually critically endangered. So when the pandemic hit and the government shut down in March, where our leatherback season would have started, and we weren't able to start the project until June, we decided, you know what, perfect time for the hawksbill season. So let's just focus on hawksbills and see what there is to the story of hawksbills nesting at Gadoka. And lo and behold, we have shit tons of hawksbills. I mean, shit tons for like a critical endangered species, which is really neat because we actually have at this point way more hawksbills than leatherbacks, which is a little bit sad, uh, but very, very encouraging because either there's a huge influx, even though the largest, until that day thought to be largest hawksbill beach is not seeing the same increase in hawksbill turtles as we have seen here. Maybe just type of sanctuary, we don't know, but yeah, so we have a good amount of hawksbills. And so we now, this year actually ran not just the leatherback season, but we actually ran kind of two seasons in one of eight months, which was really long from March till October to patrol for leatherbacks nesting here and hawksbills, which is really exciting because the main problems that we have is really poaching, poaching of eggs, poaching of females. We have a massive problem with erosion. So um, the reason is we're on top of two continental shelves. Obviously, I mean, we're a volcanic country, so the coastline is pretty dynamic to start with. But then additionally, sea level rise because of climate change is also eroding large parts. So we've lost about 60 meters of beach horizontally, which is a lot. 
in the past 15 years. So our beach is becoming narrower and narrower and narrower, and it's also moving more and more into the vegetation line, which is likely one of the reasons we do not have that many leatherbacks nesting here as we used to. But it could also just mean that general population trend is going down. But we still need to establish a baseline since nobody's worked on the beach for the past 10 years. And another focus of our project is actually in studying in water behavior. So a lot of the, that's where we come to the applied science. So a lot of the data that exists in the, actually the entire world is heavily biased towards nesting females and nesting beaches. And so even within Costa Rica, management plans for sea turtles are based on nesting beaches. Although we have two coastlines, Pacific and Caribbean. And of course we have sea turtles living in those waters. And it's super important to figure out where we have hotspots of sea turtle activity in those waters and how we can protect those hotspots from fishing, from plastic pollution, and all of that. So hopefully with our satellite tracking that we're doing, we can inform later on exactly those management plans. Um, also establish connectivity so sea turtles don't usually eat where they nest. So the turtles that are eating here nest elsewhere or not nesting yet because they're juveniles and the turtles that are nesting here go elsewhere for eating. And so we are really interested of seeing, okay, where are the feeding areas of our sea turtles? And how can we, you know, make sure that the protection that we kind of try to establish on the nesting beach goes beyond that on their migratory routes, as well as in their feeding areas as well, with the help of other organizations that work just in those areas, or the governments that are responsible, for example, in those areas, if that makes sense. Oh, so that just sounds um, amazing. Yeah. So that's the, in a nutshell, that we do. Like I said, everything is a little bit of a challenged by the pandemic. <laughs> but luckily, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of sea turtle projects finance themselves through volunteerism. So that means people that come into the project to work there, which is great. But honestly, I got a little bit tired of it after a while because we had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that, you know, were less, more or less motivated, but we kind of depended on them for work and for money. And it was not a very pleasant thing because sometimes priorities shifted as well of like what was more important, the sea turtles or entertaining our volunteers. And so I decided if I have ever, if I will ever run a project, I will make sure that the funding exists without having to have volunteers. I mean, I love getting volunteers that are super committed and super into this whole thing, but I rather, you know, use quality than quantity in, in, in that case. And the pandemic actually just kind of proved my point in a different aspect that, okay, if we would have banked on volunteerism right now, we would have been totally screwed. And so many projects literally tanked or are barely scraping by because they have no money to run their operations. So I don't really want to brag. I honestly, in every meeting where people were like shooting shit of how bad the financial situation was during the pandemic, I kept always very quiet because. <laughs> It didn't look too bad for us. I mean, we did okay. I mean, I was able to hire the staff that I needed and had the money to do so. And we were able to cover the beach just as we needed. So, yeah. How did you do After that? Challenges, but it was okay. How did you do that? What, what different funding route did you take then? Yeah, so I'm kind of exploring different, <laughs> different things than like, I don't, I didn't like the volunteerism thing. And I also didn't really like the classic funding, governmental funding, you know, model where every year you're writing like a fell 20 grant proposals of which maybe one or two are getting funded. And then you don't know again for the next year, if you will have funding, if you won't have funding. And I also find that this is not very sustainable. And so I have actually signed up or was recruited from a crowdfunding platform that I mean, you're pretty probably familiar with Patreon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the idea was pretty much to create a Patreon for conservation projects. Oh. So that means that instead of, you know, support content creators and, and poor artists, it's about grassroots organizations that are always kind of, you know, looking for funding and they're not the WWF and all those big 
once we don't have large administration, but we are also usually the ones that get hired by those big organizations to do the work on the ground, right? Or that get the, the grants that those organizations are providing. And so this platform is called Milky Wire, and you can pretty much become a local or like a monthly supporter for like, I think three to $5. And that way we have a monthly income. I mean, it just started and it's already working pretty well. Um, and I hope that this is just going to be better even in, in the future. So that means over my social media platform, I leverage a lot of times these kind of, you know, opportunities for people to kind of, you know, become a supporter or donate money. And then I also have two amazing friends that I got to know or met 12 years ago at this point, I think, but I was still in my master's and they, when they met me said, you know, Chris, once we have money, we will start supporting your work. And they actually founded a organization in Germany that is yeah, just fundraising pretty much for my work here in Costa Rica, which is also pretty amazing. Yeah. So this is, I would say the main income streams. And then of course my YouTube channel is also creating income for our conservation work. Uh, so content creation. So I'm just trying to not, I, yeah, to not depend so much on one income. Diversify. <laughs> and so, yeah, to diversify and also to um, maybe think a little bit outside of the box because I'm really tired of the classic funding models that exist. Yeah, and that's what I really wanted to ask about that because sometimes people starting an organization or maybe want to do something similar, they don't even know where to start. And maybe they're like, I don't want volunteers or, or I don't want to apply for a million grants. What's something that I can do? And those are fantastic examples, which of course we will have links to all of them. And I definitely need to look into all this too, because I, I haven't heard of that before. You said it was Milky Wire. Mm -hmm. Milky okay. Wire. It is, it's an app. So it's really cool because it's kind of interactive. So we, so we are called impactors. It's kind of the influencer idea, but impacting rather than influencing. And so we are pretty much one of the requirements that we have is that we need to upload updates from the field. So it's a little bit like Instagram stories, kind of edgy, doesn't need to be curated. Like really, I mean, they know we don't have time and also sometimes not the internet bandwidth yeah. to do kind of do this super well edited videos or whatever. So they just want to show our supporters like what we're up to in the field, right? Like snap a photo of when we're excavating a nest, when we're driving with our car somewhere. I mean, just kind of the real life stuff that's happening in the field when we're sitting in the front of the computer analyzing data, all of that. So it's kind of an interesting concept because I think it's very different from these glossy, you know, pamphlet that you might get from like the WWF that is like enticing you to donate money for the mountain gorillas where they were able to hire this like world-class photographer to go out into the Virunga and snap photos, right? So it's, we don't have that type of budget, right? So, I mean, a lot of times for my nonprofit, I'm a one woman show. I'm a tree marketer, bookkeeper, everything in one. Also biologist, conservation, whatever, you know, it's just like whatever is needed. I made our homepage. I run our social media where other organizations have social media officer and a webmaster and a photographer and a bookkeeper and a whatever, right? So, yeah. So it's, it's a really neat thing because it's really the grassroots in initiatives that I think really make the world go around if you if you're honest um that really get a shot of directly being supported which I think is great and then I mean the other thing I don't know see I hate it like getting being raised in Germany which is also one thing like culturally and as a woman I you know humbly I would say yeah I got really lucky I don't know if it's luck I think Maybe I got lucky in that sense that I met incredible people, but that really believe in me and the work I do. And ever since they've met, they have followed my journey. They have supported me in different ways, financially, emotionally, and so on. But some of them, yeah, some of them have money. Some of them have connections and they have kind of brought me into contact with incredible people that want to spend money on things like I do. And so... This is how I come about funding sometimes as well. Mm. Oh, it's so great. Yeah, I definitely wrote down the smoky wire and I can't wait to check it out. It sounds fantastic. And then of course, 
anyone listening, you have to go check it out too and see how you can support Coast, which will have all the links in the show notes. And so I know we've been chatting a while. So one of my very last questions that I absolutely love that has always so much impact it feels, what advice would you like to share or what message would you like to give to anyone listening right now? I think my advice is always to depend on what I'm probably right now thinking about myself as well. And I think recently I've thought a lot about a lot about vocation, about passion, about, you know, why we do what we do. And I think, I think one thing, and actually I listened to a podcast and a podcast that talked about purpose and how purpose in people's life can be like a guiding star and how people that have purpose, even though if they name it purpose or not, but they have this just like guiding star, the reason of why they get up in the morning, kind of maneuver the up and downs of life so much easier than other people, right? Like it's, and I kind of, it made me think about that. I think I did have a purpose very early on in my life, which I feel very blessed that I have because it has pretty much always given me direction of where I'm heading in life. And it also has made my failures less painful because I had a reason to try again, right? I mean, it was, of course, it was painful. I don't want to say it wasn't, but I had a reason to not give up. And I feel sometimes people become so misled of what other people, parents and teachers are trying to tell them of what they need to do with their lives, of that they need to become a lawyer, a doctor, whatever else, that they need to make money, that they need to support a family. And I think this is just a whole load of bullshit because we're coming kind of circling back to it just because you might be good at something. Maybe you can become a doctor. Will you enjoy that? Will that be your purpose? Is that really why you get up in the morning to do it? And I mean, I'm not saying you need to save turtles or you need to become a conservationist. I just think everybody in life should find their why and I think people that have found it are so much happier and usually have so much more impact as well. So when you are in a situation where you still need to decide of where you're heading in your life, I mean, and you still don't know, go and travel. Try to figure out your purpose first before you commit to any career. Although, I mean, even a career is not, you know, meant for eternity. That's another important thing. But Take your time. I mean, you don't need to have a freaking PhD at 23. Really, you don't. Um, you just kind of be in probably in student debt until you're 60, 70 years old and you're never able to enjoy your life. So rather figure it out first and then go full energy for it. I think that's the only advice I can think of right now. Oh, I love it. That's so good. Could not agree more. And so how can somebody get in touch with you? Say they're super inspired. Maybe they want to say hi, or maybe just follow you on social media and all the cool shit you're doing. What is the best way for someone to do that? Yeah, I think the easiest way you just probably to shoot me a direct message at usually probably Instagram. That's probably my most active platform. Um, so very creative sea turtle biologist on Instagram. <laughs> Um, but also my webpage, seaturtlebiologist.com, you can find emails, for example, where you can uh, contact me. And I think you will find all the social media platforms, YouTube channels, and so on that you might want to uh, look into. <laughs> as, as, as of course, I'll have everything easily accessible. And Chris, thank you so much for coming on and sitting down with me today. This is going to be awesome. I cannot wait to get it out. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.